I spend my afternoons in, in a beautiful park in, in Xiamen, China, and I'm studying lots of pure math and math physics. And one of one of my more distant goals, like like I'm contracted to write a book on uh, topological quantum computing, and I've sent emails to the publishers saying, look, you know, when that's out the door and published, uh, I'd really like to write another book. And then you, years from now because you know, hopefully I've got 30 more years and this this next book after that would be on the theme of that's this kind of dream of mine what I call uh, femto tech or alternative it means the same thing Fermi tech now if you're a, a physicist a Fermi and besides being the name of Enrico Fermi who's a famous Italian American nuclear physicist uh, a Fermi is a unit of length and it's a millionth of a nanometer. It's a million times smaller than a nanometer. Now, virtually everyone's heard of nanotech, right? What, what is that? That's, that's molecular scale engineering. So, so imagine little robots the size of molecules and they're programmed. They're, they're like, yeah, they're, as robots and really tiny, but molecular scale, molecular size. But they're capable of picking up, you know, with their hands, hands but commas, one atom and putting it somewhere else. So you pick it up from wherever you want and put it wherever you want. So it's a kind of mechanical chemistry, right? because in putting it somewhere, you can put it next to other atoms and, and hence chemical bonds may form. And then you can then build any structure. Right? You have total control of matter at, at the atomic scale. And that's the big dream of nanotech, nanometer scale technology. Right? That's, that's what nanotech is. Now, in the uh, uh, 70s, 80s, well, let's, let's go back, say 59, I think, was uh, the first talk, academic talk, on the possibility, and then it was a wild idea, by, by Dick Feynman, uh, the new Nobel Prize winning physicist. He gave a famous talk called, uh, if I remember correctly, there's plenty of room at the bottom. Now for him, the bottom was the nanoscale. Right? So he's asking questions like, well, uh, could you put the full contents of the Encyclopedia Britannica on, the, on a pinhead? Stuff like that. So, so just how small could you get the substrate for storing information? So, so he envisaged this you know, nanometer scale technology. Now, in those days, it, it sounded weird. It was just a sort of a far-fetched idea from Dick Feynman, who's known for having weird ideas. He's also the father of um, quantum computing. In 1881, early 80s, uh, he, he was one of the pioneers of this notion of, of quantum computing. So, you know, a zany, creative mind. And then later on, another American, you know, Eric Drexler wrote, I think, mid 80s, a famous little book called uh, Engines of Creation. And his big dream, his, his, uh, his vision was to have a molecular scale robot you know, with an arm you know, that's programmable. So you can imagine a DNA like uh, linear tape containing uh, computer type instructions to instruct the robot arm to move in such a way that it pick up an atom here and put it there. And so by having a whole assembly line, if you like, of these molecular robots, you could build whatever you want. So, so we call these uh, molecular sized robots replicators because they, they can make copies of themselves and have zillions of them. And then you program them all together in a way that collectively they build macro scale, you know, human scale objects. So they, they could build whatever you like. And then in the uh, Star Trek series, Next Generation, the, now those characters in that TV series were living in the 24th century. Right? And they had nanotech. They, they had these replicators. And you know, the, the captain of the starship would go to the replicator in the wall and, and just say, uh, Earl Grey tea. And, you know, atom by atom, quickly, the, 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 his tea would be manufactured at, at the atomic scale. Okay, so uh, now that 
when, when Drexler came out with his book, a lot of people criticized him, saying, oh, this is ridiculous. You, you've forgotten about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle from quantum mechanics, or you've forgotten about the thermal agitation. I mean, these, these molecules, atoms are vibrating so much you can never position them or control them, blah, 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 blah. And uh, he, he just got pounded by, by criticism. But he sensed that he was correct. And so uh, a few years later, I think six, he then wrote his PhD thesis at MIT, came up with this famous book, Nano... No. Nanotechnologies? I, I can't remember the title. But anyway, uh, he more or less tried to prove to all his critics that it would be possible to, to, to you know, manufacture things with atomic level precision. Now today, uh, what, two decades later, uh, nanotech is just booming. I mean, governments are pouring, literally, you know, individual countries, in, literally pouring hundreds of millions of dollars a year into nanotech research and development. And products are already coming out. Like, uh, you can you can treat uh, the surface of clothing in such a way that there's effectively stain-proof. You, know, you, you drop some cream or whatever on your suit, and it just you just wipe it off. It has no effect. It just doesn't stick. Stuff like that. So that there are already uh, nanotech type applications uh, coming out from the manufacturers. So effectively, nanotech today is well launched. Right? It's, it's an established field. No one criticizes it anymore. Uh, so it's it's almost status quo, right? Established. So to speculative crazies like myself, we're starting to wonder what's next? What comes after nanotech? Well, you know, like we have millitech, you know, that's like millimeter scale technology, and then there was microtech, like that's a millionth of a meter, and nowadays we have nanotech, that's, that's a billionth of a meter, so we're going down by a factor of three yeah, three orders of magnitude each time. M milli, micro, nano. Well, what's next? That would be 10 to minus 12. You know, a thousandth of a nanometer. That's a picometer. So could we have a technology that, that, that uses something in physics at, at, at the picometer scale? Answer? No. Why not? Because there is nothing in nature at the Pico scale. It just doesn't exist. Right? So we're forced to go down another factor of three, or the magnitude, to the so-called femto, F-E-M-T-O, femtometer scale. That's 10 to minus 15 of a meter. That's a millionth of a nanometer. Now, at that scale, there, there, there are substances, there are entities in physics, in nature, that are there at that, those tiny scales. What are they? Well, uh, well let, me give, let me give you a bit of background. I, I, imagine, imagine this is an atom, okay? So you've got the nucleus in the middle, very dense, that's where most of the matter, the, the mass of the atom in the middle, and you've got all these electrons flying around, it's sort of crudely like a solar system. So you can make an analogy between an atom and a solar system. So nucleus, electrons, or sun and planets. Okay. How big is an atom compared to the nucleus? How much bigger is it? Well, it's about a hundred thousand times bigger. So the, the guy, the New Zealand um, British guy who discovered the nucleus, uh, Lord Rutherford, he made a, an interesting analogy. He said, an atom is to a nucleus, I'll put it the other way, a nucleus is to an atom as a fly, this Norman house fly, is to a cathedral. That's, that's about the scale. So, a femtometer would then take you right down to the scale of the nucleus, or even protons and neutrons inside the nucleus, because this, this is what a new, um, that's what a, a nucleus is made of. And this is just a, an agglomeration of protons and neutrons, these elementary 
so-called elementary particles. Or if you go inside the proton or neutron, you get three quarks. So that's like the next level down. So my big dream now is to, I, I'm, I'm just learning lots of physics and math. And basically I'm just sniffing. I'm trying to find phenomena in physics that just maybe could be used as the basis for a future fento technology. Right? Maybe you're manipulating quarks or protons and neutrons or nuclei somehow, somehow. And that, that's the big research quest, how, how to do that. So that you get a technology, engineering, computing, whatever, at the femtometer scale. Now, I can't say much more than that. I mean, I've got a list of potential candidates, you know, phenomena in, in physics that may be used. Now, <clears throat> I won't bore you with the details because it's extremely technical. You probably won't have a clue what I'm talking about. But, but there are some potential candidates. But I can say this. <clears throat> if a future femto or fermi, fermi tech, femto tech comes into being, how much more powerful would it be compared to nanotech? Well, uh, imagine, imagine this is one nanometer, this long, it's near scale up. Now a femtometer is a millionth of that length, right? <laughs> so if you were using femtometer scale particles, you could have from here to here, you could have a million more of them than just in one nanometer particle, if you like. Because it's a million times smaller. So you can put a million of them in a line like that. But you've got three-dimensional space. So you'd have a million more that way, and a million more that way, and a million more this way. So you've got a million, million, million more particles, you know, femtoparticles in that cubic nanometer. And because, because two of these femtoparticles are now a million times closer together than two nanoparticles, they're a million times closer. So the signaling speed between the two is a million times faster because they, they, have, they cover a distance that a million times smaller. So the signaling speed between the two is a million times faster. But you've got a million, million, million more of them in that unit cubic nanometer. So the total performance of this femto cube, if you like, is a million, 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 million times greater. That's a trillion, trillion times greater than nanotechnology. Now, if you didn't, if you didn't follow that argument, it doesn't matter. Just, just remember the bottom line. Bottom line is femtotech could outperform nanotech by a factor of a trillion, trillion. So femtotech would do to nanotech what nanotech does to human scale technology. It would utterly outclass nanotech. Okay? Now let's have some fun. Let's, let's jump ahead again. What's the next thing after femtotech? Well, that's 10 to minus 18 of a meter. It's a thousand times smaller than a femtometer. So if you had a technology at that scale, it would be called ATO, A-T-T-O, ATO tech. Okay. So it would be a thousand by a thousand by a thousand times a thousand. So what's that? It'd be a million million times, is that right? Yeah, it'd be a million million times uh, more performant than, than Femto tech, and so on and so on. Now, here comes the punchline, and it's really weird. Some of you have probably heard of Fermi's Paradox. Now, it's the same Fermi, you know, brilliant guy. He, uh, he was very skeptical of, of SETI when he heard of it. SETI, S-E-T-I, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. You know, the, the ETs out there. If it's so commonplace, if life is so commonplace out there and on the trillion, trillion stars in our observable universe, well, where's the proof? Where, where's the evidence? Well, why aren't there big McDonald's signs and stars out there? Why do we have no proof that these hyper-advanced civilizations 
billions of years older than we are, where are they? That was his famous question. Fermi's famous question. Where are they? That, that's Fermi's paradox. If life is so commonplace, why do we have no proof of their existence? The, the intelligent ones, the intelligent life out there. Well, here's one possible answer. They're everywhere. These hyper-civilizations are everywhere. Like maybe each elementary particle contains whole hyper-civilizations. Now, it sounds crazy, but there's a logic to it. I mean, think about it, right? The smaller you get, the faster you get, the more performant you get. So if you go down from nanotech, femtotech, atotech, and so on and so on. You go maybe maybe right down to Planck tech. That's the smallest size, smallest length that we can even conceive of in, in string theory, in modern, modern theoretical physics. Now, how small is the Planck length? Well, it's 10 to minus 35 of a meter. So that's 10 times. It's 10 times a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a meter. It's incredibly tiny. And that's, that's, that's as small as we can even think of. Right? So imagine these hyper civilizations, billions of years older than we are, hugely more advanced, just getting smaller and smaller and smaller because smaller is faster. Right? So you get this tendency that maybe the hyper civilizations out there long ago, billions of years ago, just went down. And so for all we know, our so-called elementary, laughable term, our elementary particles are actually hyper-civilizations. Now, that's a good science fiction plot. It sounds crazy, but there's a logic to it. You have to admit. 